Good evening, and welcome to the second 2022 lecture in the Vancouver Institute series for our current program. I'm Roslyn Kunin. I'm the current president of the Vancouver Institute. And first, I would like to acknowledge that the Institute's home on the campus of University of British Columbia is on land that has been sacred to the Musqueam people for over 10,000 years. Then I would also like to acknowledge that the Vancouver Institute has been delivering informative Saturday night night lectures to the population of Greater Vancouver for over a hundred years. And we do this because of the support of our members. So we strongly encourage you, if you are a member, to make sure you renew your membership regularly. If you are not a member yet, there are no people who are not members. There are only members and prospective members. We hope you will take out a membership soon. And of course, if you possibly can, can take advantage of the opportunity to donate to the Vancouver Institute on our website. There's the information for memberships and, and donations. Please take advantage of those. During uh, one of the big features of our lectures is the opportunity to ask questions and hear the answers from our speakers. And in the world of Zoom, you will notice on your, sque your screen, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free at any time during or after the lecture to type in a question in the Q&A section. And after the speaker has spoken, we will try to answer as many questions as time is allowed. So feel free to enter your question and uh, hope you'll we'll get a chance to hear, hear the answer. Okay, our speaker today is Dr. Joy Johnson. And there are certain things that are top of mind for us in BC and Canada now. Right now, the pandemic is one of the issues. And another major issue is talent shortages lack of qualified people in the healthcare field and in just about any other field that you can mention. And Joy Johnson has been leading, leading us to solutions for both these types of problems. Her background is in medical research and not only helping discover the new medical research and ideas that will lead to cures, treatments, preventions of the various diseases that ail us, but also medical policy so we can implement this new knowledge in ways that will benefit our, uh, our health. In the issue of uh, providing for talent, of course, it is the universities that are creating all the talent that we need. And we need to have the kinds of universities that are producing students in the different fields, in the ever-changing fields, with the ever-changing talents and abilities that Canada needs. And Joy has been doing this too in her role at UBC. She has uh, had many, in, uh, mobilized many initiatives in research and in policy. She has been the scientific director of the Institute for Gender and Health, a dimension that our medical research hasn't always been up to date on for the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Uh, she has many, many awards, the UBC Killam Research Prize, the School of Nursing Centenary Medal of Distinction. She's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. And she has co-authored over 180, count them, peer-reviewed articles that have contributed to our knowledge. She was recognized in 2010 as one of BC's 100 Women of Influence and has received Queen Elizabeth II's Diamond Jubilee Medal. I now turn the screen over to Joy Johnson. She is going to be talking to us about a world of difference, how universities must evolve in a post-COVID world. Joy? Well, thank you ever so much, Rosalyn. It is wonderful to be here this evening. I want to say a special thank you to the organizers and everyone at the Vancouver Institute who makes this le lecture series possible. Just imagine over a hundred years, a tradition over a hundred years of lectures. I want to say a special thank you this evening to David Gold. David is going to help me with some slides this evening, and so I'm deeply appreciative. 
And I learned in the back room today that it's Fabiola's birthday. So I also want to say happy birthday to her. Um, forums for thoughtful discussion of complex issues are really more important than ever. And I think that is certainly recognized by the Vancouver Institute. And I want to say it really is a privilege to be part of the conversation. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you this evening on the unceded traditional terriers territories of the Swilatuth, the Squamish, and the Musqueam peoples. And as a settler on these lands, I recognize a responsibility to address and repair relations with Indigenous peoples whose lands we occupy. And acknowledging this is an important step toward reconciliation. I also want to um, pay my respects to elders past and present. So before I begin, I just want to say that the title of my talk reveals the innate optimism that I'm going to bring to my subject this evening, how universities must evolve in a post-COVID world. Now, I've got to tell you, I submitted this title a few months ago, and in November, it really did feel like we were going to experience a post-COVID world. Uh, I assumed that, um, you know, things would be lifting and Omicron was not even on the horizon. But here I am, I'm speaking to you through Zoom from my office in downtown Vancouver. Uh, so much, I have to say, for my powers of prediction. And even though I was wrong about COVID-19 ending, I remain optimistic about the future. And now I've got to tell you, this is not out of a naive faith in the certainty of progress, rather because I believe, and I know that I'm not alone in this, that as difficult as COVID-19 has been, it has also shown us something profound about our collective power to confront and overcome big challenges. It has shone a bright light on the consequences of economic and social inequality. And it has reacquainted us with the idea of a larger public good. Of course, in some places, COVID-19 has stoked divisions, politicized health decisions, and empowered wannabe autocrats, not to mention truck convoys. And I think today we all are experiencing some of these tensions. But as I say, I choose to be optimistic. And I see in our response to COVID-19, the seeds, the seeds of a more humane, just and sustainable future. Now that said, we have to tend to those seeds very, very diligently if they're going to grow. Because to quote a familiar phrase, the past to the future are not found, they are made. And as president of Simon Fraser University and someone who believes passionately in the value of higher education, I want universities to help carve out that path. But to do that, I believe institutions of higher learning have a choice to make. At this critical moment, Universities can choose to respond to the economic and social forces that are upending our world. We can decide to ignore them, to pretend they don't exist, or we can um, embrace them and think about what the opportunities are. If we think about the opportunities, I think this path can lead to meaningful change. The other, I think, the path of ignoring or choosing not to pay attention I believe can lead to irre irrelevance or worse harm. That's what I want to address this evening, how universities can, and I believe must, change to meet the de demands of a world in flux. And I want to propose that embracing difference as an animating principle for change can help reinvigorate the idea and purpose of a university. Different ways of teaching and learning, different ways of knowing, seeing and responding to difference that is all around us. So I'm going to begin with the question, why does difference matter? Why do I believe that embracing difference holds this promise for the university? Well, first, for the simple reason that universities like Simon Fraser University and the University of British Columbia are located in one of the world's most cosmopolitan metropolitan areas. And we should reflect that. SFU has grown to more than 37,000 students and 7,500 faculty spread over three campuses in downtown Vancouver, Burnaby, and in Surrey. 
Surrey is BC's fastest growing and most diverse community. At SFU, we have 8,500 international students from 137 different countries. And our, research collaborate, collaborate, our researchers collaborate with more than 3,000 institutions around the world. So difference matters because difference is a fact of our community. Our community is big, it's diverse, it's dynamic, it beats to world rhythms. It's one of the many things that I love about universities. And I would also add that difference matters because it makes us better. We are better teachers, better knowledge producers, better researchers, better innovators, and better change makers. So let me dig in a little more to the promise of difference. And I'm going to begin by turning to a couple of anecdotes from my own work. As Rosalind said, before I came to Simon Fraser University, I was the scientific director for the Institute of Gender and Health at the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. And in that role, I was constantly reminded of how uh, we do not pay attention to sex and gender differences, even though we could see in very plain ways that things like gender roles and gender expectations shape our life opportunities and our health. And it became clear to me how ignoring difference was distorting the impact of research and holding back innovation. Take something as seemingly straightforward as research into automobile safety. Despite decades of improvements to safety standards and exacting regulations, pregnant women and their fetuses were suffering from unique injuries in car crashes. What could account for this? The answer really was quite simple. Crash test dummies came in a variety of shapes and sizes, but they did not come pregnant. No one bothered to account for this difference and the effect it was having on research into car safety. And as a result, pregnant women were getting hurt unnecessarily and their pregnancies were being jeopardized. It was a similar story in the area of clinical trials on new drugs. Historically, these studies were conducted initially on male animals and then on male humans. Now, why, might you ask, would they do such a thing? Because scientists had trouble accounting for hormone fluctuations in females, fluctuations that seemed to really mess up their experiments. And so, rather than take the time to account for this difference, it was easier to ignore it to pretend that it didn't exist or it didn't matter. And as you might imagine, soon after some of these new drugs were approved for use, it was discovered that they were creating unexpected and I would say harmful side effects for women and they had to be removed from the market. Luckily, the research community has woken up to the importance of sex and gender differences and are now incorporating these considerations in their research designs. The point I am making here is that accounting for and understanding difference can significantly propel innovation. It pushes the frontiers of scientific discovery. And in so doing, it helps researchers make a difference in the larger community. So on this account, the ignorance of difference or worse, a willful indifference to difference what some call the epistemology of ignorance, shows us that what we don't know or what we choose not to know is as important as what we do know. This insight into how difference affects research holds important lessons for how we think about the futures of the university. In the same way that accounting for difference is a source of research innovation, I believe it can propel innovation and change on our campuses. And so this evening, I wanna talk about a number of important ways that difference matters to the future of our post-secondary institutions. First, I'm gonna talk about how we can account for difference when we develop and tailor our educational programs. Second, how we can incorporate difference to widen our understanding of human knowledge and ways of knowing. And third, how a better understanding of difference 
can help us respond effectively to the pedagogical needs of our students. And finally, I want to say a few words about how difference is a critically important lens through which we can better see our university community and the world off campus and how that understanding can help us contribute to the larger public good as we enter the post COVID world. So I'm going to begin with the first how difference can help us de develop and tailor our educational programming. So this is an enormous topic that could take us late into the evening. And I'm going to zero in on one area where SFU is working to embrace difference as a means to advance meaningful reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and First Nations. Owing to the work of SFU's Indigenous partners, faculty and students, indigenizing our curriculum and decolonizing the university is a major institutional priority, one that I fully support. This effort takes place on many fronts including the core of our curriculum. In her recent report on racism and discrimination in BC's healthcare system called In Plain Sight, Mary Ellen Turpel lafont brings this issue into sharp focus. She writes, when addressing racism, whether individual incidents or broader systemic issues, we often find the root cause is willful ignorance. The ignorance of distinct cultures and histories, as well as the knowledge of bodies, both physical and spiritual. The knowledge of a shared history that, while common to us all, has been experienced very differently by the Indigenous branch of our collective BC family. The willful ignorance that Trapel Lafond identifies runs throughout our society's institutions and the systems and structures that ground them and universities are no exceptions. It's no surprise then that a number of Trapel Lafon's key recommendations apply directly to what we teach our students. Among those recommendations, Trapel Lafon calls on the BC government to require all university and college programs for health professionals to identify, recruit, and encourage indigenous enrollment and graduation. She recommends that every medical student receives accurate and detailed knowledge of Indigenous specific racism, colonialism, and Indigenous health and wellness. And she says that the BC government, working with universities and First Nations, need to establish a joint degree in medicine and Indigenous medicine. A joint degree in medicine and Indigenous medicine. Chappelle Lafont's report and recommendations articulate a reality that universities and institutions must respond to if we are to stay relevant to the needs of our students and the demands of the public. We have to move past the habits of willful ignorance and develop new habits of willful understanding, inclusion, and partnership with people who have been shut out of higher education. And to that end, Trapal Lafon's report and recommendations are core to SFU's thinking and planning for the new medical program that we are designing with First Nations Health Authority and the Fraser Health Authority. Our ambition is for this to be a new kind of medical program, one that will train health practitioners to provide a diverse range of primary care services to Indigenous and other historically marginalized communities. In so doing, the new medical program is part of a larger and ongoing shift across the educational landscape to expand our epistemological foundations. This shift has generated controversy in some places. Incorporating difference into the canon is seen by some as an attack on the university's traditions and its claims to be the bastion of objective truth. Needless to say, I do not see things this way. In the same way that the epistemology of ignorance holds back scientific innovation and willful ignorance is the root cause of individual and systemic racism, limiting our ways of knowing greatly diminishes our ability to understand. And pursuing a better understanding of the world in, its all, in all of its complexity is at the core, it's at the core of what a university should do. 
So when we, we pay attention to different ways of knowing, we aren't walking away from the enduring purpose of higher education. We are reanimating and reinvigorating that purpose. So I wanna give you a couple examples again from Simon Fraser University. Extending new narratives in the history of philosophy is a partnership of universities around the world led by SFU professor, Lisa Shapiro. Its aim is to retrieve philosophical works of women and individuals from other marginalized groups to help deepen our understanding of the philosophical traditions that shape us. And by so doing, to surface long neglected philosophical themes and insights. The project is focusing on philosophy in the medieval, Renaissance and early modern period through to the Second World War. It's a, such a great project, in part because it involves collaborators around the world. This project is contributing to new and exciting narratives in metaphysics, ethics, and what counts as philosophy. And I mentioned this project because it reminds us that at its best, a university isn't about a narrow adherent, adherence to doctrine handed down by authority. There is a place for that, but not at secular schools of higher education. Universities are meant to advance and expand our understanding of what it means to be human. The expanding narratives and philosophy project isn't breaking with the enduring idea of the university. It's prying open the canon to different intellectual traditions, different philosophical perspectives, and to different ways of knowing about the world. In other words, it is doing what universities do best. Because it's Black History Month, I also want to raise the example of how African scholars and artists have largely been ignored in the Western European university system. Africa has, a rich and has rich and diverse forms of heritage, indigenous knowledge, and practices that support social innovation and sustainable development. Yet this scholarship has been largely ignored in university curricula. At SFU, we're beginning to interrogate and address this absence. In the recent UNESCO report, Reimagining Our Futures Together, a new social contract for education, it is emphasized that no single people or perspective can possibly possess all the solutions to the complex, multifaceted challenges facing the planet. The report calls us to recognize and redress the systemic exclusions and erasures and build a pedagogy of solidarity. To quote the report, without the valuing of different epistemologies, different ways of living and seeing the world, it is, important, it is impossible to build a pedagogy of solidarity. I wanna now shift gears a little bit and bring this discussion to the classroom because difference not only expands the way we generate knowledge and deepen our understanding of the world, it also expands the ways in which we transmit knowledge and engage with ideas. COVID-19 has offered us a very practical and necessary demonstration of how this works. Almost overnight, universities and colleges had to move from in-person to online learning. It was probably the single biggest collective organizational challenge that we have ever undertaken. It took enormous effort, creativity, and patience from everyone across the sector. And I will be grateful forevermore to all of those who made this happen. Almost two years later, I am delighted that students have returned to on-campus learning. I really do love a vibrant campus. But as a university administrator, I also recognize that COVID-19 showed us that there is more than one way to teach and learn and that there is no putting the genie back in the bottle. Long held pedagogical assumptions and certainties have been forever upended by the power of new technologies to change the way we interact with one another. Just look at us tonight meeting on Zoom. We still teach and will continue to teach and learn in the classroom. There is no doubt about that. But the classroom is expanding and changing in a myriad of ways. I have no doubt that years from now, COVID-19 will be seen as a pivot point in this regard, an accelerant that unleashed huge changes to the university environment. 
And I believe that if these changes serve to expand the reach or relevance of education and enables it to be provided to more people in more places, as this technology has the potential to do, then COVID-19 will have had at least one very positive legacy. This legacy will be compounded and amplified if we take other lessons from COVID-19 to heart. Of those lessons, perhaps the most consequential is what COVID-19 did to expose the costs of economic, social, and racial inequality and inequity. At the beginning of the pandemic, we like to say that we were all in the same boat. It soon became clear that this was not true. Some of us were in a very different storm. Indigenous people, Black people, people of color, women, new immigrants, people living in poverty and our elderly, all suffered the pandemic's health and economic impacts more than others. At the same time, powerful new social and political movements like Black Lives Matter gathered force in response to institutional violence inflicted on communities of color and the institutional race, racism that normalized it. And the discovery of hundreds upon hundreds of unmarked graves at residential schools across the country brought into stark relief the heartbreaking legacy of colonial injustice. These events and political uh, movements are having a profound impact across our society, including on our campuses. We are called on to look anew at how we see difference in our communities. We recognize that today's gaps in access, participation and outcomes are based on yesterday's ignorance and oppressions. The conversations have been sometimes very difficult. The issues can be extremely challenging, but we're working to confront them. Certainly not perfectly by any means, but in good faith. We have a long road ahead, but there are many demonstrable signs of progress. For example, the Scarborough Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion in Canadian Higher Education, signed by more than 40 Canadian post-secondary institutions, holds us accountable for combating anti-Black racism. And I'm proud to say that SFU and UBC are signatories. At SFU, we're working with BIPOC faculty, students, and community members to open up new pathways for people to attend and succeed in university. We're engaging with refugee communities in a number of important ways, including research, scholarships, and additional supports for refugee students. And we're working on our structures to create accountability with a new vice president responsible for people, equity, and inclusion. And I am delighted to say that Dr. Yabom Gilpin Jackson will be um, coming into this role beginning in April, and she will be providing leadership to help advance equity, diversity, and inclusion across the university. At SFU and across the post-secondary community, this progress is grounded in the recognition of our responsibility to expand the reach and impact of university education, a recognition that is the root of my optimism. Since the end of the Second World War in Canada and elsewhere, the expansion of university education has tracked the growth of new social movements, the creation of the welfare state, and a redistributive economy that has greatly increased the well being of millions of peoples. Today, the challenges we face are very different than they were in the mid 20th century. But I think that same purpose endures. As we stare into an uncertain world, racked by conflict, growing economic inequality, threats to our democracy, and a fast warming planet, universities can and we must remain engines for expanding the economic and democratic franchise to more people in more places. At my university, this, is the, this ambition really is part of our identity. At SFU, we started as the radical campus and we are now known as the Engaged University. It's a brand that comes alive in the many ways that we work to cross the bridge from campus to community to be an engine for positive social and economic change. Not to stand athwart history shouting stop, 
but to take our place within history to carve a better path, a more humane, a more democratic future. So at the end of the day, I believe this is the power that attending to difference can make. I think it's an idea that reflects the moment we are in, a moment of upheaval and change, a moment filled with tremendous anxiety, but I think also tremendous potential. It's a moment of choosing because the future is not found, it is made. And through difference, we can help tackle and overcome the biggest challenges of our time. From the existential threat of the climate emergency to the costs of growing inequality. We can help to heal and repair a broken world. We can build trust, empathy, and solidarity. We can help expand the horizons of the possible. And in short, through difference, we can make our collective future in a better image. Thank you so much for listening to me and I am look, looking forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you very much, Dore. That was fascinating. And it was uplifting and encouraging, which you can't say about too many things in these very interesting times. Uh, maybe I will start with one just to warm up the audience. Uh, how do you deal with groups on campus? And we've been hearing about them, and not necessarily at Simon Fraser, but other campuses across Canada and, and the continent that are very singly motivated by one issue and are tend to be intolerant about discussion, disagreement, or any other points of view? You know, it's such a great question. And I think it's also a bit of a symbol of our time, um, Rosalind. Um, I, I think that, you know, if, if, if nothing else, the university has to be a place of, of open public discourse and discussion. And, um, you know, that is really what academic freedom is about. Um, that's what freedom of expression is about. And we really need to hold space to be that public square. And that does mean uh, um, the importance of listening to one another, even though we might vehemently disagree with one another. And so one issue politics, I think, can be extremely problematic because it can close down the discourse. Uh, and really, I think that if anything, universities really have to stand um, for the opportunity, um, you know, and for the importance of ensuring that um, there, there can be open discourse and discussion. Thank you. We now do have quite a few questions popping up. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the single best or the single worst aspect of online, universi online learning at universities? Oh, where to begin? You know, it's interesting. And what we're learning from our students is that some of our students really do thrive um, on, with online learning. Um, and I would say um, the best part is that particularly when some materials are recorded, students can go back over those materials time and again. Um, and, and I think that can be very positive. And we also recognize their different learning styles and that different students will learn differently. I think, you know, for me, the problem with online learning um, or one of the challenges is that I've always said learning at a university, a lot of it happens, it, the important learning happens outside the classroom as well as inside the classroom. It's really, you know, through that kind of social discourse, you know, um, being exposed to different ideas, um, meeting people, having conversations, going to lectures, um, listening to ideas that you might not otherwise listen to um, is really important. And that kind of social, um, that social network as well. And I think that's what our young people are missing more than anything with online learning. Um, and so for that reason, uh, it, that, that's part of the reason I'm so pleased to have us back onto campus. Okay. Thank you. Judith Hall says, thank you, Joy, for being so inspiring. How can UBC's universities work together? Yeah, thanks, Judy. So good to have you with us. That's great. Um, yeah, I think it's really important for universities um, to work together, and they do. I, I want to make a couple of comments. The Research Universities of uh, Council of British Columbia brings together our research-intensive universities and uh, on a regular basis. 
And we are collaborating in a number, in a number of areas, um, areas like the Quantum Algorithms Institute, areas like uh, some of our supercomputing capacity. Um, there are, there's an initiative happening related to the Scarborough Charter I talked about being hosted at, at UBC, where SFU will participate. We're discussing ways that we can together tackle the climate emergency. So I think it's not always transparent to everyone, but those discussions are happening. And I think that fabric of, of collaboration is very, very important. And I would say my president counterparts are very interested in finding ways to continue to strengthen those collaborations. I'll also say, and I think this is something we take for granted in British Columbia, is that the college and our transfer system also creates incredible opportunities for us for students to move from colleges um, into university. And it's really quite special um, that we do recognize one another's educational programming and enable that to take place. So I think British Columbia is quite special. I think we could do more, Judy, as you you know suggest by your question. Um, but I, I, I re and, and, and so much more can be accomplished as we do work together. So thanks for that. Hey, and Max Cameron asks, do you think universities have a role to play in encouraging democrat democratic engagement and how can universities promote civic participation? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think civic participation, democratic engagement, you know, one of the, the a core pillar of that is understanding. It's actually being able to understand the issues of the day, understanding how government functions, um, being able to critically analyze. And so I think, you know, university education is absolutely foundational. Um, and, and we see um, uh, all sorts of mechanisms to, to help enable um, our students to become uh, better democratic citizens. Um, so for example, through student government, through participation in our Senate, um, by um, participating in the politics of the university, um, by protesting um, you know, when they have issues that they want to you know, um, bring to light at the university. So absolutely, I think actually it's one of our most important, one of our most important functions is to create the citizens of the future, citizens who will participate and utilize their democratic franchise. Um, and uh, to support these different elements, I think is critical. And then there are other, you know, I think there are other very concrete ways, um, you know, that, that um, you know, through debates and, and dialogue through um, um, uh, other, uh, other mechanisms such as uh, some of the um, visits to Ottawa or co-op co programs in which our students are placed in Ottawa or in government, providing them with an opportunity to see how government functions also really enables, um, I think, a, a better understanding of uh, what it means to be a citizen and how complex um, citizenship can be. Okay. And COVID restrictions have caused considerable upheaval for students, I think more so in the secondary and primary than in post-secondary, but even in post-secondary. What has been done to ensure that students caught up in this upheaval can participate in the new directions ahead? And will students be able to make up for this disruption? Yeah, you know, I think it's such a good question. And I think I think all of us are very concerned about what young people have given up in the last two years. Um, there was a study done, um, re completed recently by the BC Centre for Disease Control, looking at the psychological impacts of um, COVID-19 on young people because they have been so socially isolated. And um, I think that we all have to pay particular attention um, to thinking about how we will help with the reintegration um, and ensuring that um, our learners at the university feel fully supported. Um, you know, at, um, at Simon Fraser University, we've been trying as hard as we can to continue with the continuity of our course teaching, uh, trying to accommodate students where we can um, so that their learning is not disrupted. But that being said, um, it has been um, very, very difficult. It's been difficult because, uh, you know, many people remain very, very anxious. Um, about COVID-19, are anxious about returning to campus. Um, even though uh, we are working very closely, obviously, with our public health officials to ensure the safety of our students, faculty, and staff. 
So it really is a, uh, I, I would say it's a particularly challenging time for, for universities. And uh, in addition to that, I think we all are paying close attention to how we can um, support our students uh, so that they can complete their degrees. And um, I am concerned, I am concerned about that. And it's something that I think all university presidents are watching very, very closely. Thank you. And you may have answered this, but someone is asking, how will the goals of your university interface with other institutions of learning? I don't know whether that means post-secondary or colleges or... You know, it's so interesting. I mean, some of the themes that I talked about this evening are certainly, these are not new themes to universities right now. I think all of us are, are struggling with, um, you know, some of the social movements that I talked about are thinking about our obligations around reconciliation, are thinking about, you know, how we can remain relevant uh, and are thinking in particular about how we will continue to support the economy. You know, Roz, you mentioned earlier um, the importance of ensuring um, um, skilled, you know, uh, a skilled workforce, uh, people who will be able to uh, take up and meet the needs of employers of the future and universities have a critical role to play there as well. So I think there are a number of common goals. I think that, um, you know, where SFU really tries to focus right now is around um, that engaged um, aspect, thinking about how we can continue to bridge that divide between the university and community and have an impact in the world. And that's not to say that other universities aren't doing that as well. They do it in many different ways and they have different foci. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I'm the first to recognize that we are supported by the taxpayers' dollars and we need to, and students' tuition fees, and we need to make sure that we are providing um, an education that is relevant um, and, um, and meets the demands, um, but also um, fulfills uh, the needs of, of our learners. So uh, certainly challenging times, I think, across the post-secondary sector. And Bill Hooker has a question about fulfilling the needs of people who may not be your learners. How can the university speak to the proportion of the population susceptible to conspiracy theories verging on paranoia and leading to events like January 6th? Yeah, January 6th. Well, what about February 5th as well? I mean, it's just so interesting to see, um, I think, how particular viewpoints are taken up. And I think this is something we need to we do need to really concern ourselves with. I guess, you know, this is, again, this is the Joy Johnson perspective on some of that. I don't think, um, and, and this was really interesting to me around the vaccine issue as well. We had a number of people um, that we, I was aware of at the university who initially were not getting vaccinated, for example. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily because they were anti-vaxxers per se, they were afraid. They were afraid of vaccines. They did not have knowledge. They were not supported in their decision-making. Some of them had come from countries where medical practice was very suspect, where they had felt experimented upon in the past. And so it really took our public health experts to really sit down with people to really help them see uh, and understand um, you know, the importance of vaccines. And I think there was um, a number of people who in the end decided to get vaccinated. Now that's one small example. So, you know, I do believe that education is powerful, that we do have the opportunity to work with people who um, might not fully understand um, or have the full picture to, to share our, to share information, to make sure that we are. Um, I think as universities, I mean, that's why events like this are so important to really share knowledge, to shine a light on, you know, what's happening on the world, in the world, to talk about recent evidence. Um, but that being said, I also recognize, you know, that this polemic is very difficult, that people are very um, hardened in their positions. Um, but at the outset, um, I, I think I suggested that I am an optimist and I do believe that education, if nothing else, I think education is the powerful force that can help sway the tides in this regard. So, um, and we just have to keep at it. And we have to provide a, an opposing point of view and so that's also why I was very pleased in Vancouver today to see uh, counter protesters, you know, talking about the importance of some of the restrictions that have been put in place to keep our population safe. We need to demonstrate that there is a different point of view. And that is also in part what democracy is about. 
Now, here is a question I did mention. I have been doing some research work connected with the potential new SFU Medical School in Surrey. And Wendy McGinn asked the question, and we all like to hear the answer. When do you anticipate the new medical school will open? Oh, Wendy, if I only knew. So let me tell you um, uh, uh, where we're at with the medical program. Um, the, the, um, the NDP government, when they were in election mode, um, in their platform indicated that they would support a second medical program um, in the province. And we actually at SFU had been talking about a medical program off and on for the past 14 years. And uh, so when we saw that, we're, we were actually a little surprised, but um, I think quite delighted. And then in the mandate letters to the Minister of Advanced Education and the Minister of Health, we do see language about the development of a new medical program. Um, that being said, um, this little um, detail called uh, COVID-19 has preoccupied um, our, um, our Ministry of Health. And um, we are in conversations with them now about, um, about the program. You know, it takes a lot of time to develop the curriculum. Um, there has to be um, um, obviously accreditation attended to faculty hires, new dean, a new dean, et cetera. And to be clear, we do not have the budget in place yet. So until we cross those hurdles, it's gonna be one hurdle at a time. Um, the, uh, we will not have a, a, firm, a firm date for when that medical program will come into existence. I am, I, I really remain very passionate about it though. And, um, you know, I, I, in my conversations um, with government, you know, uh, it's like, it's just hold on, we're getting there, we're getting there. But we really, um, I'm really looking forward to, to the time when we can have those discussions. And, you know, the government um, has not committed the funding yet, and that's obviously going to be the next important step. Okay. And Robert asks, how would you respond to what seems like the major global turning point away from democracy and towards authoritarianism, the rise of willful ignorance, to use your phrase? Yes. Well, you know, again, uh, this is in part why, um, you know, universities need to continue. I, I mean, for one thing, um, I would say I really do believe in scientific diplomacy. I think that often where governments can fail in their discussions uh, about, you know, political issues, scientists will continue to do their work together and create bridges. Um, I also, so I, I really think that's something for us to be thinking about as an academic community about how to kind of try to maintain those bridges. I've been really um, paying a lot of attention as well um, recently to what's happened in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, scholars in Afghanistan in particular, um, those who were um, educated in a Western tradition, you know, are fleeing for their lives. And um, I think that, and, and I've been working with, there's a number of people working on this, trying to ensure safe passage for those scholars and creating spaces for them at our universities with the hope, with the hope that one day they will be able to return. And again, that bridge will get rebuilt. So um, I, you know, I talked at the very beginning about the importance of nurturing these seeds. And these are the seeds I think that we really need to nurture. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we need to continue as well to encourage, you know, this is, again, not as a university president, but as a citizen, encourage our governments to um, uh, influence um, these countries where democratic um, rights are being eroded and, and hold them to account as best we can. Um, it is a discouraging time, I have to say, um, but if education can't play a role in trying to move this forward, I don't know what can. You and here is a, another question of great impact. Will cheaper online universities arise and will they compete with universities like SFU? Yeah, it's a great question. So we do have online universities um, that you know provide that type of education for students who really prefer to only learn online. And um, uh, I'm not actually convinced it's necessarily cheaper. I think it can be because you don't necessarily need all the infrastructure. Um, but there will always be a need for bricks and mortars institutions like Simon Fraser University and UBC. Uh, and there will always be particular kinds of courses that are, are difficult to teach online. 
I'm thinking about engineering, I'm thinking about medicine, I'm thinking about, you know, um, we've got a fantastic uh, program in uh, uh, that that includes a dance program at Simon Fraser University. You know, these are very difficult disciplines to to teach online. But also um, because the university's purpose is bigger than is bigger than the undergraduate or the graduate kind of seminar and uh, and what takes place in the classroom. It is also about a learning community. And I, I really uh, continue to believe in the strength of the learning community. So I think that we will see online offerings. We will see, I think, universities continuing to think about what we're referring to as hybrid education. I've been doing a lot of thinking about that. How can we um, try to be as nimble as possible um, and support um, different learning styles? Um, but that takes a lot of technology. It takes a lot of flexibility. And we've got, I've got to tell you, we've got an exhausted professoriate. And it takes, uh, you know, we're just not quite there um, in terms of our capacity um, to move that forward. But I've been talking also to our government about the need for, you know, a digital infrastructure to help um, with this kind of uh, with this kind of education. So uh, it's not a it's it's hard to you know I don't have a crystal ball on this. My my sense is that we will continue to see a number of online universities um, grow. Um, but that institutions like SFU and others will continue to um, be uh, provide on-campus experiences. We've got thousands of students living on our campuses, wanting to be part of the university community, uh, and that's really important to all of us. Okay, and Carol asks, how can we reach the protesters who don't believe in science when most don't go near universities? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's why uh, we need to create bridges, uh, bridges between the university and the community. And um, I, I think that's also why I'm very cognizant of the fact that um, we need to think about who is attending our universities. I think first time um, students who really are coming to university first, first in their families to come to university are very important. Uh, they really play a powerful role in their families. Um, and we also have to create fora and opportunities, um, you know, to, to bridge that divide. Uh, I think also, you know, to do that work meaningfully, um, we also have to be prepared to also listen to the concerns of others and to see if we can, you know, find some common ground. And that's hard. Um, that's hard work. And um, I think it takes a lot of skill to get there. And sometimes we won't, we simply won't. And I recognize that, I'm not naive about that. Um, but, you know, some of our, um, you know, for, I think about, you know, Simon Fraser University and our public square program. You know, I think about Vancouver Institute and its outreach, um, you know, um, our Center for Dialogue, creating opportunities for, for groups who really have disparate points of view to come, and, come um, together uh, in common cause to talk about those differences, it's important. And I think as a society, more now more than ever, we need to be able to do that uh, and to find structures to that enable that. So again, not easy. Um, um, and again, I would say, as I said uh, earlier, that the universities do have a role to play in this. Thank you. And a very specific question. Will Simon Fraser reconsider opening the Surrey campus for over 55 continuing education classes. <laughs> I love these specific questions. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, we have a terrific um, um, program um, for continuing education, lifelong learning. And um, uh, I think that, in that that really is a matter for the Dean of Lifelong Learning. And I know she's very interested in trying to get back to in-person learning and with lifelong learning as well. And we're not there in all of our classes. Uh, and it is so important. You know, Surrey really is an incredible hub. Um, so I will take that as a vote to, to, get, that, to get that taken care of and uh, take that feedback back to our Dean of Lifelong Learning. Thank you. And here is a question that touches a sensitive spot, namely the pocketbook. With so many priorities facing governments today, including health, the economy, climate change, are you concerned that our governments will not see universities and post-secondary education as a priority in terms of funding and support? Yeah, I, you know, I will say that today I have been um, very um, pleased that the government you know, continues to value and see the value of post-secondary education. 
And all of the reports that are coming out around gaps in the workforce point to the need for um, you know, well-educated well um, uh, individuals to fill um, what really are um, uh, jobs um, that, requ that require advanced skills, advanced knowledge, et cetera, university degrees. And the government understands that, that gap um, and are trying to address that gap. And so because of that, I do think there are positive signals. You know, the government has, um, you know, for example, um, committed to um, 2,600 more tech seats in the province of British Columbia um, in order to fill some of the gaps that, they, that we are all seeing. Uh, you know, uh, I think we all would agree there's never enough money um, and that we all would like to see more funds. And I think, you know, most universities and colleges are feeling the pinch these days. And in part because our operating grants really have not grown substantially. Um, but there are many priorities um, in government and I recognize that. But what is interesting to me is that I look at the, the current government's priorities and their priorities really are around the greening of the economy and climate change. These are areas the universities have a key role to play in developing new technologies and thinking about policies and thinking about what we potentially can do. Um, they have, um, you know, priorities around uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. And again, universities, as I talked about this evening, have a key role to play um, and they have uh, and they really want to grow the economy. And again, the economy won't be able to grow in British Columbia um, without a well educated workforce. So I really think um, the government is understanding that. Uh, we will see in the next few weeks what the budget looks like um, and what the economic plans are for the government. And we're all you know, waiting to see where those investments will be. Um, but I think that what, we, what I hope to see are, are these synergies, the synergies that really can benefit the university but also benefit British Columbia. Thank you. And another pocketbook question. How can the cost of education for students be lessened? Right. So, you know, I think most universities and ours included are really looking at, um, you know, uh, what the full costs are for university education. And there are a number of pinch points um, for students. Uh, one, of course, is housing. And we know what the housing demands are um, in British Columbia, in Vancouver in particular. And, um, and the lower mainland. And so that's something we need to be thinking about. And I would say most universities, um, ours included, are, are putting more and more dollars into bursaries um, so that those who really are economically disadvantaged can um, 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 be supported um, to remain in university. Um, I will also say um, that, you know, uh, particularly um, for some international students, our universities remain a great bargain, particularly for students coming from the United States. Um, that's not to say that our tuition, uh, you know, our tuition rates should rise, but just to recognize that there is a great value in both the quality of the education and really the costing of the education as well. Um, and I think we need to recognize that. And then I would also say that governments have continued to invest in student loan programs and other programs to really help students. And those are really important as well. Um, and then finally, we are looking at other creative ways to help deal with costing at the university. And these are everything from making, instead of asking students to buy books, to make them available online and to use online resources and, and thinking about all these other types of costs that students experience. And, um, you know, trying to make sure that we have other work learn opportunities available for students so that they can continue to work, um, because many do need to work as they attend university. So it's a complex matter. And it's something I think every university is alive to. And it's trying to find that balance um, and to make sure that, again, that there's value for students um, um, and that they can, you know, continue to participate. All students should be able to, you know, all, you know, young people should be able to have an opportunity to come to university if they so desire and if they have the capacities to do so. Okay, and we have time for one more question from George, and this brings your talk full circle right back to the beginning of what you started with. Have any better seat belts for pregnant women been proposed by today's auto manufacturers? Well, thank God, yes. I mean, it was interesting. I went back to take a look at that um, that image again, and and it really was in their you know late 1990s that they started some of that work. 
And, you know, I think that we now do because they do, you know, test and develop better seat. It's really about the seatbelts and they're much better than they used to be. Um, and those injuries really have been reduced, which is great. And I, I do think, again, it's so interesting to think about how when we pay a attention to difference, um, we really can develop innovative solutions. So that's a challenge for all of us. So interesting to, to try and see what we, we can't see. Uh, and I know that sounds ridiculous in a way, but that's the challenge for us is to really um, to think about what's not there and what potentially could be there. Well, I want to thank you very much. We have run out of time. We did not run out of questions. So I apologize to all those whose questions weren't answered. Get them in early next time and we'll try and answer as many as time permits. But I definitely want to thank you, Joy, for your talk. I specifically want to thank you for your optimism. A lot of learned people from medieval rabbis named Nachman to current writers like Steven Pinker have pointed out a very specific thing that we often forget in these interesting times. And that is, to put it in the vernacular, if we have the capacity to screw up, and we seem to have that in spades, <laughs> we also have the capacity to make things better, to solve things, and to... Uh, remediate the things that need remediating. I really liked your optimism. I liked your positive attitude. I liked your intelligent, thoughtful answers to all the many and varied questions that came up. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your insight. And we wish SFU every possible success in the future, including a very soon upcoming new medical school. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosalind. And thank you, everyone. Dave. <laughs> Next week, we have another very interesting speaker who will be talking on the uh, opiate crisis. We have Mr. Benjamin, Professor Benjamin Perrin, a professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law, is going to be talking about overdose, heartbreak, and hope in Canada's opiate crisis. We've had an education crisis, we have a COVID crisis. Sometimes we forget the long ongoing opiate crisis that has been with us for some time and is still with us. Please join us next week for this very interesting talk. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>